You are listening to Aristogenesis, Episode 2 and Part 2, The Hyperborean Myth, presented to you by NordiskRadio.se. Following on from our last episode, we now return to the Hyperboreans as we explore deeper into the writings of the ancients who spoke of them, from Herodotus to Pindar, and look into what exactly they had to say. Our last episode was focused mainly on the scientific evidence of the High North as the origin point of our people, whereas this one will be more poetic and mythological. We'll also be looking into the traditions that have been left to us by these Hyperboreans and the festivals still celebrated across Europe to this day. The nature of the subject matter means that there are a lot of references to texts written by ancient poets and historians, and if we were to simply read from them all, it would have taken up a considerable amount of the episode. So, instead, we have saved the readings for only the most important parts, and we will include the rest both in our further reading section and in the script of the episode, that will be published shortly. As always, this episode must come with a preface that the promotion of love for one's own people is not to be equated with the promotion of hatred for others. And in these politically turbulent times, such clarifications are unfortunately necessary. The Greeks, Celts and Romans all spoke frequently of a divine race of beings in the North throughout both their history and their mythology. In fact, can become quite difficult to discern what is myth, what is history, and what is simply poetic allegory. But there is truth within all three. The first thing that is worth mentioning is the fact that when the Romans told their stories of a great tribe from the north whose intellect brought about countless innovations, they attributed this to the Celts. Ironically enough, as late as 2500 BC, the Celts and Latins, from whom the Romans descended, were a single tribe with a single language. So, when attributing these men of the north to the Celts, they were, in effect, half right. Both the Celts and Romans were descendants of these Hyperboreans. Things get interesting, however, when you realise that the Celts themselves also had stories of a divine race from the north who were ascribed the same characteristics as those the Romans gave in their descriptions. It is, I believe, an obvious case of mistaken identity. As these tribes moved further and further south, over such vast distances and long periods of time, each group told the same stories of the men from the north, and their children took this to mean the men to their north rather than the north and their ancestral golden age gradually morphed into myth. The Greeks and Romans also had a few funny ideas of where exactly Hyperborea was actually located. It was almost universally agreed that Hyperborea was a European land to the far north, bordered by mountains called the Riffians. But theories on the exact location of the Riffian mountains varied wildly. The most reasonable guess is that of Herodotus, amongst many others, who placed Scythia as the closest geographically to Hyperborea, believing the Carpathian Mountains to be the legendary Riffians and the Scythians to be the closest contacts of the Hyperboreans. Aside from the Celts and the Scythians, the Germanics were also thought of as potential candidates for the Hyperboreans, as it was thought that the source of the Danube might be somewhere within the Riffians. The most amusing theory, at least to me personally, is that of Hyperborea being in Britain, a theory put forward by the Greek historian Hecateus of Abdera in the 4th century BC. Whilst this might be the perfect opportunity for me to brag smugly of a Hyperborean Britain, it is quite obvious that Britain, a land to the west, with comparatively few mountains in it, is not the land of mountains in the north. However, this misconception makes a little more sense when given some context. At this point in time, many Europeans were unsure of whether the island of Britain even existed. It was a place steeped in myth and mystery, 
So Hecateus was most likely just confusing or combining two different tales of mysterious lands. It's also important to note the account of the Greek poet Pindar. Obviously, being a poet, he is going to romanticise Hyperborea and use very fanciful language to describe even the most mundane aspects of such a place, such is the nature of his job. His accounts provide a sense of Hyperborea not so much as a physical place, but akin to a kind of state of being. To him, Hyperborea is not simply a country to the north, but a sacred place of wonder and beauty and light into which only the truly worthy may enter. In his work, The Pythian Ode, written sometime in the 5th century BC, he tells of Perseus, son of Zeus, journeying north into Hyperborea. To Perseus is given the fairest of glories which mortals may attain. He is to sail to the furthest bound, yet neither ship nor marching feet may find the wondrous way to the gatherings of the Hyperboreans. On top of this, there is also the account of Alien, citing a quote from Aristotle that has been lost to time in his historical miscellany, written sometime between the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD. Aristotle says that Pythagoras was addressed by the citizens of Crotus as Apollon Hyperboreus. This implies that the Hyperboreans were not only a race of men, but also a state of being that truly great men could possibly become, or be likened to at the very least. Herodotus, on the other hand, gives us the opposite impression. Through his more sceptical approach, combined with his enthusiastic willingness to record any local legends of interest, regardless of his personal level of belief in them, we are given yet more insight into Hyperborea, as he paints a picture of Hyperborea being a country just above Scythia. A mysterious country of very advanced people who were the originators of many Greek religious traditions, but a country nonetheless. However, he also speculates its existence, seeming to not believe that there were any Hyperboreans living in the High North at the time of his writing, but that local legends concerning Hyperborea were extremely common. He adds that the Hyperboreans were thought to have passed elements of their culture and sacred wisdom further and further south. Once again, this lends weight to the theory of a migration into Europe from the High North. Herodotus in his account tells us that the Scythians and Isidones don't speak of any people living in Hyperborea anymore, but that the idea of them has existed in the minds of some of ancient Greece's finest minds for generations. They do speak, however, of the Aramaspi, who we will return to later in the episode, though if you remember our talk on Aristos in our first episode, you might be able to guess just from their name who these Aramaspi might just be. He also mentions Dodona as being the first place in Greece to receive the gifts of the Hyperboreans. But before we continue, it is necessary to give a little background on the people of Dodona, and why them being the first people amongst the Greeks to receive these gifts, especially these religious gifts from the Hyperboreans, is so significant. First of all, the name Dodona comes from the river of the same name. I'm told that the etymology of the name of said river is somewhat vague, but I believe that it isn't a stretch to speculate that Dodona is a derivation of the Indo-European word Danu, meaning river or fluid in Sanskrit, and is, as you might have guessed, also the root of the name of the Danube. This naming scheme prevails throughout Indo-European civilizations, from Donbass in Ukraine to England's River Don, to the banks of the River Dardanus, mentioned in the Aeneid as the birthplace of the Trojan race, amongst many others too numerous to mention. However, this is purely speculation on my part, as the name itself is reported by scholars as being pre-Greek and having first been established as a pre-Aryan religious site dedicated to a mother goddess of some kind. It's very possible that the name existed before the Indo-Europeans even arrived, and the similarity may just be circumstantial. 
It was inhabited by the Indo-European people, now known as the Mycenaean Greeks, with them arriving between 2000 and 1500 BC, and it was the site of the first oracle of Greece. Dodona was also purported by some, including the great philosopher Aristotle, to be the origin point of the Hellenes as a race. This origin probably isn't literal, however, and most likely refers to the idea of Helen, father of the Hellenes, setting up his tribe of people at this location after the great flood of Greek myth had passed. Such a location, bearing the first Mycenaean oracle of Zeus, sitting in the northern outskirts of Greece, would be a fitting choice for one such as Aristotle to mark as his people's birthplace. So, it's clear that this was a very significant place to the Mycenaean Greeks as a people, and thought of by many as a place in which their racial identity came about, as well as the first place in Greece that the Aryan Sky Father was worshipped. So Herodotus' statement that Dodona was the first place in Greece to receive the gifts of the Hyperboreans is obviously extremely significant. However, before we return to the Hyperboreans, it would be intellectually dishonest of us to recommend Herodotus' work in our further reading section, but not to address one of Herodotus' most outlandish claims that he himself admits is pure speculation. When he talks about Dodona, he recounts a story told by the Egyptians of two black doves that flew from Thebes to Egypt, then one to Libya and the other to Dodona. This black dove then settled upon an oak and spoke with a human voice instructing the locals to set up the temple of Zeus there. Herodotus believes the story told to him by the Egyptian priests that the two doves were Egyptian women, called doves because he believes that the locals mistook their language for the chattering of birds, despite the fact that they were said to speak with human voices and the birds being black was in reference to the Egyptians' darker skin tone. I believe that this is a combination of bias and confusion. Regarding why there would be any confusion as to the origin of Dodona in the first place, Dodona was said to have been the site of a pre-Aryan sacred garden, wherein the pre-Aryan Greeks would worship their highest deity, the Great Mother Goddess, until it was conquered by the invading Aryans, in this case the Mycenaeans, who then rededicated the sacred site to the Sky Father, called Zeus by the invading Mycenaeans. And regarding both the Egyptian influence as well as the Egyptians being so dark-skinned as to appear black to the local Greeks, we first of all know that the Egyptians were, especially in the non-noble castes, of a darker complexion than the Aryan Greeks on average, but through DNA testing and even some remaining mummies on display in museums even today, we can clearly observe that some Egyptians were blonde and even red-haired. The Egyptians were also desperate to project themselves as the originators of all culture in the world, and by telling this story of the two black doves as being about themselves, then they could effectively take credit for the religious and cultural achievements of both Greece and Phoenicia exploiting the Greeks' confusion as to the origins of Dodona's sacred grove. It was said that the Egyptians and Scythians often quarrelled over whose culture and traditions were older, and that the Egyptians would always end up having to yield as the younger of the two, an admission that we can imagine as being rather humiliating for the Egyptians, whose power and influence stemmed almost solely from their ability to project themselves as the nation most steeped in antiquity and the culture capital of the world, thereby reducing their risk of being attacked by their neighbours. Egypt was a breadbasket, not a militaristic superpower, and so this carefully cultivated image would have been extremely important to them. Herodotus, in his own work, admits to have been initiated into the Egyptian mystery traditions, and so he certainly believed what the Egyptian priests were telling him wholeheartedly. So it's no surprise that he believed Egyptians to be the source of all culture and tradition. 
So, while he was mistaken, we shouldn't pass too harsh a judgement on these remarks without having first evaluated the historical context that has informed his personal bias. My own personal interpretation of this story, of the Black Dove, is that it is a hybridization of the stories of two different peoples that both tended to the sacred grove at different times. The bird having landed on an oak would explain why the Indo-European Greeks had decided that this place was truly sacred, as the oak is very much revered throughout Indo-European mythology. The significance of this being a bird that was divinely sent is not uniquely Indo-European, but the practice of observing the flights of birds in order to ascertain the will of the gods, such as with the Roman auguries, and the prevalence of sacred birds as general messengers of the gods, is found throughout all Aryan mythology. What's interesting is the type of bird that's mentioned. A black dove. Doves as a mythological symbol are almost universally, not just in Indo-European myth, regarded as feminine, and are more often than not seen as a symbol of peace. The dove, as a result, is almost always associated with the mother goddess in most mythology, and would have quite possibly played a key part in the pre-Aryan Greeks' story of the founding of the sacred grove of Dodona which they constructed a shrine to their mother goddess. As for why the dove is black, I would say that to the Indo-European Greeks who had invaded and colonised the grove, it would not have been a dove in the myth at all, but rather a raven. Not only are ravens renowned throughout Aryan mythology as the messengers of the gods, giving advice, wisdom, and the instruction to build temples and set up sacred sites, but they are also said to be the birds of Apollo. Apollo is the god of the sun and the god of prophecy, amongst other things. Apollo, as we will explore deeper later in the episode, was said to be the most worshipped god amongst the Hyperboreans, who many claimed to be his people. Apollo and his Hyperboreans were also credited as having established many oracles, one of which existed in Dodona, the first place in Greece to receive the gifts of the Hyperboreans and the reported birthplace of the Hellenic race. It's my belief that over time, the two stories, one of the dove and the pre-Aryan establishment of the sacred grove, and the other of Apollo and his raven, giving the invading Aryans instructions on where to build and established their oracle, were combined. The dove and the raven became a black dove. Now, I am not for one single second saying that I am wiser or more knowledgeable than Herodotus, the father of history. I am merely able to look at the story more objectively, having the good fortune of being able to get access to DNA evidence, archaeology, and wider Indo-European history and mythology, almost none of which Herodotus had access to. Unlike Herodotus, I also have no reason for any strong feelings towards Egypt, neither positive nor negative. As previously mentioned, I felt it would be dishonest to recommend our listeners read Herodotus' account of Dodona and not address this glaring inaccuracy in his usually very competent work. So, now that we've established where Hyperborea was according to the Greco-Romans, and addressed the level of its significance to the foundation of the Hellenic race, it's time to really delve into who the Hyperborean people were to the Greeks and Romans, and how they were said to live, what exactly they created in terms of traditions, and what Hyperborea as a place was like. It is said that Hyperborea, a name that directly translates to above the north winds, was a temperate paradise despite its northern location, and was in perpetual springtime. The logic for this at the time was that Boreas, the Greek god of the north wind, lived below Hyperborea, hence the name, and therefore his cold chill couldn't reach Hyperborea. I would say that this account 
of the High North's climate lends weight to the idea of it once being a much more agreeable environment, the changing of that environment potentially being a driving factor in the southward migration of the Aryans. Aside from its extremely comfortable climate, it was also said to have landmarks of divine beauty, the likes of which could not be compared to anywhere else on Earth. One of the most beautiful was its garden paradise, called the Garden of Apollo, that was left wild and untamed, and yet the Hyperboreans lived in harmony with this place of natural beauty. However, the most significant landmark for the purpose of this podcast is the great river that flowed through all of Hyperborea, upon which swam a flock of white swans. This river is the Eridanus, Danus, as we have already established, being the Indo-European word for river, and whilst Eri might be spelt differently to the usual variant used by Greeks to denote nobility, it is very easy to consider that a possible translation of Eridanus is the Arian River. But I believe that there is a much more telling name hidden within the mythology surrounding this sacred river. The prefix Eri or Eri means the first or the dawn or the early. So the most reasonable translation of Eridanus would be the first river. As with all great rivers and nature spirits, Eridanus was personified by the Greeks as the king of all river gods, the son of Oceanus and Tethys. He also has a daughter called Zeusippe, a woman whose name translates to she who yokes horses. For those who don't know, a yoke is what is used to attach an animal to a cart, plough or chariot, devices either invented by or perfected by the Indo-Europeans. So, from the first river came she who yokes horses, an obvious allusion to the Indo-European peoples, all of this said to take place within Hyperborea. And regarding the flock of white swans who dwell upon the river, it's interesting to note that the Hyperborean symbolism exists in the Aeneid. And regarding the flock of white swans who dwell upon the river, it's interesting to note the Hyperborean symbolism in the Aeneid. Boreas, called Aquilo by the Romans, is the one who throws Aeneas towards Carthage. Aeneas himself is also compared to a flock of white swans by his mother Venus. Now, one might say that I am simply looking too deep into poetic mythology and overanalyzing symbolism from Virgil, but when Aquilo and the Hyperboreans are mentioned by name in some of his other works, it shows that he was obviously aware of the Hyperboreans and their symbolism, and his choice of words is very deliberate. So much for the poetry of Virgil and the land of Hyperborea, but what is said of the people who lived there? They were said to be a divine race, free from the toils of disease and hard labour, never ageing, knowing not of war amongst themselves, or amongst their neighbours, but known to beckon the greatest warriors to dwell with them. While one might argue that being without struggle makes a people weak, it seems not to be the case for the Hyperboreans of legend. This could be credited to their abundance of resources, their divine blood, their ethnic homogeny or their giant demigod rulers who were known to drive off threats and govern with virtue, justice and piety. Or you could say that these were just the romanticised ideas of men whose blood beckoned them home to an earlier golden age. It should not be said, however, that the Hyperboreans were a pacifistic race. The Greeks credited some of them with having joined them in battle, as we will cover later in the episode. Either way, these were a race of men endowed with virtue and piety who had not let their eternal golden age degenerate their bodies or minds, beings dwelling in paradise perfect and unchanging. It is no wonder, then, that they were said to be the people with whom Apollo himself dwelled. 
In Apollonius Rhodius's Argonautica, written sometime in the 3rd century BC, the Argonauts see Hyperborea in the distance while sailing down the Eridanus, and, to quote Rhodius, And to them Apollo, son of Leto, appeared, as he passed from Lycia, far away to the countless folk of the Hyperboreans, and about his cheeks his golden locks flowed in clusters as he moved. Apollo, the sun god who rides his golden chariot across the sky, is a very important figure to the Hyperboreans. We mentioned in the last episode that the sun was said to shine for 24 hours a day in Hyperborea, so it's also worth mentioning that Apollo was only said to dwell in Hyperborea for six months of the year, once again showing a link to the high north and its midnight sun. Apollo was such an important figure to the Hyperboreans that the three demigod kings of Hyperborea, the Boreades, sons of Boreas, were the high priests of Apollo rather than their own father, as well as being kings, which ties in nicely with our mention of divinely appointed priest kings and solar gods, as mentioned in our first episode. These divine priests were said to be absolutely huge in stature, around 9 feet or 2.5 meters tall. They led the eternal festival of Apollo, in which they would sing and dance across their capital, joined by the songs of the white swans circling them. Their great temple to Apollo was also said to be circular in design, and a hundred donkeys, called a hecatomb by the Greeks, literally a hundred head, would be sacrificed to the god. It was also a very interesting tale that comes to us from Antoninus Liberalis's work, Metamorphosis, written in the 2nd century AD, in which a Babylonian man befriends the gods Apollo and Artemis, and was invited to see the sacrifice of the hecatombs in Hyperborea. Upon returning home to Babylon, he attempts to recreate the hecatombs of the Hyperboreans, only to have Apollo himself appear. To quote, Apollon appeared and threatened him with death if he did not cease from this sacrifice and did not offer up to him the usual goats, sheep, and cattle. For this sacrifice of asses was a source of pleasure for the god only if carried out by the Hyperboreans. From this story, the lesson is simple. Only the Hyperboreans, as well as the Greeks and Thracians, who are both Indo-European people, are allowed to partake in the traditions of the Hyperboreans. The Babylonians, over the course of their history, were generally a Semitic people with an Indo-European ruling caste, hence this myth's referral to one single Babylonian worshipping Apollo and Artemis, rather than the corresponding Semitic gods of the sun and moon. However, when returning to Babylon and attempting to integrate Hyperborean customs and traditions into their multi-ethnic society, Apollo, a generally kind-hearted and joyous god, immediately threatens the man with death. But, returning to the giant Boreades, as well as leading the procession of the festival of Apollo, these priests were also responsible for the defence of their land, mounting their winged chariots and driving out the harpies with whom they seemed to be in conflict with, relatively often, according to myths. These giant Boreades therefore represent kings, priests and warriors simultaneously, who were the three fundamental classes of the Indo-Europeans. The Greek poet Pindar again describes the Hyperborean people and their festivities, really shedding light on the seemingly divine nature of the Hyperboreans, as he talks of Perseus going to meet them. It is with the Hyperboreans that Perseus, the warrior chief, once feasted, entering their homes and chanced upon their sacrifices unto Apollo, those famous offerings of hecatombs of asses for in their banquets and rich praise Apollo delights and laughs to see the rampant lewdness of those brutish beasts. Nor are the muses strangers to their lives, but on all sides there is the feet of maidens dancing. The full tones of the lyre and singing flutes are all astir with leaves of gleaming laurel bound upon their hair, 
they throng with happy hearts to join the revel. Illness and old age visit not this hallowed race, but far from toil and strife they dwell, secure from fate's remorseless vengeance. There, with a breath of courage in his heart, unto that gathering of happy men, by guidance of Athena, came long ago the son of Danae. We also have another source confirming both the clear association with Apollo and Herodotus' account of these traditions, which he calls the first fruits of the Hyperboreans, moving south in Pausinius's description of Greece. But what exactly are these traditions and fruits of the Hyperboreans? Well, they are traditional offerings made to Artemis and Apollo, carried to their respective temples. Herodotus tells us, And so they carry the offerings wrapped in straw to their borders and tell their neighbours to send them on from their own country to the next, and the offerings, it is said, to come by this conveyance to Delos. I can say of my own knowledge that there is a custom like these offerings, namely, that when the Thracian and Paeonian women sacrifice to the royal Artemis, they have straw with their offerings as they sacrifice. What I believe we're seeing here is the progression from a general migration from the north to a wave-based migration from gradually appearing settlements, each maintaining an unbroken line of tradition being passed down from group to group, nation to nation. This is a very interesting addition from Herodotus, all but confirming the Hyperboreans as ancestors of the Indo-Europeans. Here we have two very different Aryan cultures practicing very similar traditions, implying a common root for said traditions, as well as their respective races. The Thracians are worthy of their own spotlight, a people rich in poetry and culture, but most famous for being warriors. Their red and blonde hair and huge stature such as the Thracian Emperor of Rome, Maximinus Thrax, being recorded by men who knew him as eight foot tall, made them a terrifying force to be reckoned with. You can see how the Aryan Greeks and Thracians both practiced these same Hyperborean traditions from the high north. What is also worth mentioning is the little-known Athenian folk god, Aristeus, who was a son of Apollo, and depicted as a winged youth the same as his brothers, the Boreades. He was cited as having travelled across all of Greece, spreading his knowledge of the useful arts, such as medicine, hunting, and the brewery of beer, wine, and mead. Herodotus then tells us about customs involving locks of hair offered to Artemis in Delos, next to the tombs of the Hyperborean women who had visited them. Delos, for those who don't know, was under the control of one of Greece's regional city-states, Athens, head of the Delian League, and long regarded as an important religious centre in Greece. The Delians themselves credit the Hyperboreans with their cultural and religious traditions, these traditions having shaped all of Western civilization. The Hyperboreans who came to Athens were said to be divine beings who often travelled in the company of the gods themselves. This connection to the gods is best demonstrated with possibly the most famous and yet mysterious part of Greek religious tradition, the Oracle of Delphi. What I'm sure many of you have heard is that the Oracle of Delphi was a temple in Greece from which prophecies would be given and omens would be interpreted. What you might not know is that it was only open for half the year and that it was a temple of Apollo who, as well as being the Hyperborean god of the sun, was also the god of prophecy, and gave the gift of prophecy to the oracle whilst he was in their presence. What you may also not know is that the Greeks themselves attributed the creation of this oracle and the building of its respective temple to the Hyperboreans. In fact, in one historical account from Pausinius, the Gauls attempted to sack the temple at which the oracle of Delphi resided. They attempted to storm the temple gates, and Hyperboreans themselves appeared, and clad in full battle dress they charged, driving the invading Gauls away. 
This is only part of a wider historical account of a Gallic invasion of Greece in 279 BC in which the Greeks had been suffering catastrophic losses. But after this failed sacking, with the supposed help of the Hyperboreans, the Greeks turned things around and virtually eradicated the remaining invaders. And it was said that the Gallic leader was so gravely wounded during this rout that he was forced to commit suicide shortly afterwards. In Pausanias' description of Greece, written sometime between 143 AD and 161 AD, he recounts the tale. Now south of the gates of Thermopylae, the Gauls cared not at all to capture the other towns, but were very eager to sack Delphi and the treasures of Apollon. They were opposed by the Delphians themselves, and the Phocians of the cities around Parnassos, a force of Aetolians also joined the defenders, for the Aetolians at this time were preeminent for their vigorous activity. When the forces engaged, not only were thunderbolts and rocks broken off from Parnassus hurled against the Gauls, but terrible shapes as armed warriors haunted the foreigners. They say that two of them, Hyperochos and Amadokos, came from the Hyperboreans. The third was Pyrrhos, son of Achilles. So strong was the bond between Apollo, Delphi and the Hyperboreans that the reason the Oracle of Delphi could only give predictions and commune with the gods for half the year was because Apollo was busy dwelling in Hyperborea for six months of it. This idea of the sun being in Hyperborea for six months and then moving south perfectly lines up with the midnight sun of the Arctic, lending yet more evidence to the claim of an Arctic origin. Aside from the Hyperboreans, there was another race of men living in the high north, but below the Riffian mountains that marked the border with Hyperborea and the rest of Europe. We mentioned them at the beginning of this episode. They are the Arimaspi, whose existence was attested to by both Greeks and Scythians. The Scythians are a culture we'll be sure to give an exploration of in a later episode, but for now, they were a blonde and redhead tribe of nomadic warriors who, in their native lands, maintained a traditional Proto-Indo-European lifestyle for a very long time, due to their outlawing of merchantry and their fanatical warrior culture. The Aramaspi reportedly take their name from the Scythian term for one-eyed, though as we have already discussed in our first episode, the prefix Ari is often derived from the term for nobility, from which we derive our word Aryan. However, these one-eyed men of the High North are, no doubt catching the ear of those of our listeners who are acquainted with the Norse myths of Odin, the one-eyed wanderer, who will become very relevant very shortly. These Aramaspi are mentioned by the Greeks in Herodotus' work, as well as in the famous Greek tragedy that is rife with hidden esoteric meaning and symbolism. Prometheus bound. They are said to be in a constant state of war against griffins of the abundance of gold contained within the Riffian mountains. Entire rivers filled to the brim with gold, according to some sources. We would argue, however, that this is not mere physical gold. From a practical point of view, their remote location and the customs of their neighbours would have rendered their attempts at gathering real, physical gold worthless. The Scythians were famed for their refusal to engage in trade or merchantry of any kind, due to the weakness it fostered in their nomadic warrior peoples. They used gold only for the purpose of their beautifully crafted jewellery. This story of the Aramaspi fighting for gold is not a romanticised tale of men going up north to hunt for gold, but it is a myth, and the purpose of myth is to tell truth through metaphor and poetic allegory. Gold, without going into too much esoteric and alchemical symbolism, represents the ultimate state of being. Gold doesn't decay or change form, it is perfect and unchanging, and therefore befitting a metal of the gods. The gold that these Aramaspi fight for is 
symbolic of their struggle. They fight not for wealth, but for eternal glory, and have to become like unto gods, to become like the Hyperboreans above them, who live in an eternal golden age. The gold is said in Prometheus Bound to come from a river belonging to Pluto himself. Perhaps this gold of eternal glory is the means to conquer death, or perhaps it is a state of being that the worthy might only enter into upon leaving their mortal shell. Regardless, the significance of the gold of the Aramaspi belonging to one of the most powerful gods of the Greek pantheon should not be overlooked and should lend credence to the idea of it being more than just physical gold. The animals with which they fight for this gold are, as previously mentioned, griffins. Griffins, for those unaware, are part eagle and part lion, and I believe that the concept of the griffin is, like the aforementioned black dove, a synchronisation of two esoteric mythological concepts represented by two real-world animals eagles and lions, and merged into one as to convey the symbolism of both simultaneously. The eagle, an ancient Aryan symbol of power that I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, is the bird of the Indo-European Skyfather. It retains its significance and symbolism even to this day. The lion, meanwhile, is associated with Apollo, and likewise retains its solar symbolism in many circles. Going back to the idea of the one-eyed men, similar to Odin, they represent men who have one eye in the physical, material realm, and one eye on the divine, practical and spiritual in equal measure. It's important to note that the Aramaspi were never equated with, or even compared to, the Cyclopes or Cyclops, who are known for their ill tempers and foolish, simple ways. The Aramaspi are depicted in both art and literature as being equal parts noble and ferocious, this superficial similarity never being taken into account by the Greeks, I would say, lends weight to the idea of this one-eyed nature being more allegorical when put within its proper context. So, within this tale of the Aramaspi, what I believe we have is the spiritually minded post-migration Hyperboreans surviving in the harsh, freezing cold mountains. They are fighting to prove themselves to Zeus and Apollo in order to obtain the spiritual gold of Pluto's river, the eternal, unchanging, undying glory of the gods. On the subject of more esoteric myths, surrounding the Hyperboreans, we come to the golden apples of Hesperides, the fruit of the gods, given by Gaia, the primordial Mother Earth, to her grandson Zeus as a wedding present. These apples were said to be incredibly important. In fact, the Trojan War was said to have begun because of Paris giving an apple, this one the Apple of Discord, to Aphrodite instead of Hera or Athena. Hercules was sent to retrieve one as part of his famous twelve labours. Around the apple tree was coiled a serpent who guarded this fruit from thieving hands, both mortal and divine. Some have put the location of these apples in Libya, but when Hercules is sent to retrieve them, he is sent north to Atlas the Titan, who holds up the sky from Hyperborea. Hercules, in most versions of the myth, defeats the serpent and takes the sacred fruit. Serpent slaying is a very common theme throughout Indo-European myth, and is an incredibly symbolic tale. The serpent, often depicted as guarding some sacred knowledge or entwined around a staff resembling the helix of DNA, this slaying of the serpent, therefore, represents the Aryan warrior who has proven himself worthy of divine knowledge and mastered himself, his spirit, and full control of his physical body. I'm sure that by now, many of you listening will be familiar with a story that is superficially similar. 
There is a sacred garden paradise and a state of unchanging perfection. There is a sacred tree of fruit within this garden from which mortals cannot eat. And there is a serpent coiled around it, from whose common symbolism we can deduce his guarding some form of sacred knowledge. The similarities to the story of the Garden of Eden are, however, superficial. The true meaning of this Hyperborean myth is in fact the inverse. Rather than the serpent freely giving away divine knowledge to unsuspecting ignorant mortals cast out of paradise forever, racked with shame and guilt, for which they and their descendants must forever beg atonement, the story is of a proud Aryan warrior with divine blood setting off upon a huge journey made more noble by his mighty struggle. He masters himself, slays the serpent, and thus attains divine knowledge. All the while, this sacred garden, the home of his ancestors, was not lost to him, but rather it was a prize for his victory in the struggle. So, are there any more aspects of culture well known to this day attributed to the Hyperboreans? Well, there's one I'm sure all of our listeners will be familiar with, the Olympic Games. Or rather, one famous aspect of the Olympic Games began with Hercules' journey, from which he brought the olive tree and its wreath, a symbol of divine power and glory, down from Hyperborea in order to serve as the symbol of the Olympic Games. Once again, we look to the fantastic Greek poet Pindar for an incredible description in his Olympian Ode. The rites of the Olympic Games were established long ago by Heracles, set on his brow aloft that shining glory, wreathed upon his hair of the green olive leaf, which once from the Danube's shady streams Heracles brought hither to be the fairest symbol of the Olympic Games. For the Hyperborean folk, Apollo's servants, he so persuaded with fair words when, for the all-hospitable grove of Zeus, his loyal heart begged from the tree to make shade for all men to share, and for brave deeds of valorous spirits, a crown. For he had long since seen his father's altars sanctified, and the light of evening smiling at mid-month to the golden care of the full-orbed moon, and of the great games he had set up the contest and sacred judgment with the rites of the four-yearly feast on the high banks of Alpheus's holy river. But the land of Pelops, and the vales by Kronos's hill nourished no lovely trees, and his eyes saw a garden spread defenceless beneath the fierce rays of the sun. Then at length did his heart bid him to travel to the land of Istria, where Artemis, Leto's daughter, lover of horsemanship, received him. For he came from Arcadia's high peaks and winding glens by constraint of his father to perform the bidding of Eurystheus and bring back the hind of golden horns. And in that search he saw too the famed land that lay beyond cold Boreas of bleak and frozen breath and standing there marvelled to see its trees and thus in his heart a dear resolve was born to set them planted there, where ends the course twelve times encircled by the racing steeds. And that's it for the Greco-Roman sources that are relevant to the topic. There are many more, but most of them just further confirm what has already been said. Like me, you're probably astounded at just how much the Greeks especially had to say about them. Far from being as mysterious and uncertain as for example, Atlantis, with whom the Hyperboreans are often equated in contemporary interpretations of esoteric history. The Hyperboreans were as prevailing, if not more so, than some elements of Greek mythology that are still well known to this day, such as the Harpies or the Pegasus. However, we're not done yet. 
There are also a handful of Celtic sources we can look at. The Tuatha de Danann were old Irish gods who came by boat to Ireland and dispensed their divine wisdom out amongst the people, lording over them as warrior kings never touched by disease or old age. They were said to have driven out the short, dark-skinned savages who had previously inhabited Ireland and were said to be beautiful, tall, pale-skinned and mighty in battle. Their name is certainly worth looking into, as it appears to have changed over time. Originally they were called the Tuatha Dí, Tuatha meaning tribe and Dí being from the plural form of the Indo-European Deus, meaning God, and so it translates to the tribe of the gods. When the Celts were being Christianized, however, the church insisted that the real Tuatha Dí, the real tribe of God, were, and I'm sure you can guess where I'm going with this, the Hebrews. In order to preserve their mythology, then, the Irish Celts began to use a new term for this divine race of beings, the Tuatha Dí Danann, meaning the tribe of the gods of Danu, or the tribe of the goddess Danu, depending on the translation. Danu is an Irish goddess whose name is apparently a bit of a mystery, but given their similarities to the invading Hyperborean Indo-Europeans, it certainly wouldn't be a stretch to say that Danu is from the same root as the Indo-European word Danu, the meaning of which we have already established. They were also compared with, and often equated with, another supernatural race of beings called the Ace Seed, which might break a few ears up, but that will have to wait for another episode. Both, however, were said to be supernatural beings, and the ageless, diseaseless, highly advanced ancestors of the Irish Celtic people. And, complete with these clear Indo-European language roots, the comparisons to the Hyperboreans especially as progenitors of ethnic traditions of Indo-European peoples, is very easy to make. All that said, you might think that all of the sources on the Hyperboreans would be positive. After all, the greatest Aryan civilizations sing their praises constantly, crediting their own traditions, cultural achievements and even victories in battle to these divine people. You would, however, be wrong. St. Clement of Alexandria, a man born in Athens but choosing to die in Jerusalem, wrote sometime between the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD in his Exhortation to the Greeks, These temples of the pagans are called by a fair-sounding name, but in reality they are tombs. But I appeal to you now, even in this late hour, forget your demon worship and feeling ashamed to honour tombs. A clarification must be made here, the pagan Greeks and Romans regarded tombs as being very taboo. Tombs could not be built within the city walls, in many cases, and places of the dead were not to be disturbed. Rather, respects to one's ancestors would typically be paid within the family home. St. Clement goes on to specify who he is talking about. Why recount to you the Hyperborean women? They are called Hyperochi and Laudochi, and they lie in the temple of Artemis at Delos. This is in the temple precincts of the Delian Apollo. And finally, we have two Irish Christian accounts, both taken from the Libor Gabala Eren a book written by Christian monks attempting to reconcile the Irish Aryan myths with the biblical tale of the Great Flood in order to gain prestige and become Christianized, and as usual with these kinds of affairs, involves accusations of demonic forces and evil heathen magic. Here, these two sections are talking about the previously mentioned Tuatha de Danann, potentially Hyperborean definitely Indo-European ancestors of the Irish people. They are seen as fearsome, invading warriors of a divine nature, even by later Christians, wishing to demonise them, or make them into mere mortal men imbued with heathen power. 
they were also said to be ageless and untouched by disease, the same traits ascribed by the Greeks to the Hyperboreans, especially those Greeks living in Athens and Delos. Interestingly enough, some Irish historians claimed that the Tuatha de Dan had actually come to Ireland from Athens, but I'm afraid we're out of time to really explore their connections in a way that would do them justice. So for now, it's time to bring this half of the episode to a close. And now we move into the next part of our episode. I'm joined by Freya and Nesta. How are you guys doing? Just fine, thank you. Great, thank you. Great. Well, I thought that we should begin by talking about something very important that still links us all as Europeans now to our ancient Hyperborean ancestors, and that is the celebration of the winter solstice. It's often said that European cultures have historically celebrated this festival in different ways, yet always with similar themes. But no one ever seems to bring up why they were all celebrating it. For some, the idea of the longest night having passed might symbolise the beginning of the new year, but the Roman New Year, for example, was in March, the beginning of the farming and war campaigning season, and named after Mars, the god of farming and warfare, and the god from whom the Romans traced their ancestry, in one myth being tricked into marrying Anai Perenai, the goddess whose name literally means the eternally recurring year. And yet the Romans still celebrated this same festival at the same time as other ancient Europeans. More than this, why would a solar festival be so incredibly important to those in southern Europe? In the north, the winters became incredibly harsh at and living conditions dropped exponentially. Crops were much harder to grow, and with that animals and men alike could not be fed, making both basic living and their often warlike lifestyles so much more difficult. So, naturally, the end of this period of bitter struggle against the elements would be cause for celebration, but this same idea cannot really be said of those in the south who enjoyed far milder climates all year round, and so such a festival should not have had the same kind of importance to them. At the very least, it shouldn't have become one of the most important festivals of the year, for which preparation began months prior. So, this shared reverence for this solar festival and the connotations of a golden age that came with it must have had a much earlier Hyperborean root that retained its significance even as these ancient European cultures appeared outwardly very different. In the Roman tradition, there were actually two different festivals taking place. One was Saturnalia, in which the Romans would celebrate and remember the golden age that had long since passed, and Deus Natalis Sol Invictus, meaning the birthday of the unconquerable sun. Both concepts, one of a golden age, one of a solar rebirth, are quintessentially Hyperborean in nature. Saturnalia was said to be a time of harmony and celebration in which Romans would dance and sing and buy one another gifts, making it into a bit of a competition of who could give one another the best gift. Families would often gather together, put up decorations, feast and drink, and for this time of year alone, the slaves would be able to eat at the table with their masters and be able to speak freely. And the paterfamilias, the head of the family, the patriarch, would serve the food to his subordinates. It was far from the ideas of sexual depravity and total debauchery we are often wrongly taught to associate with Roman festivals. It was a time of happy merriment, friendship and celebration of the gods and one's own family. All of this was in honour of the golden age that was said to be before Jupiter took the throne of the gods from his father Saturn. But, as we will discuss in a later episode, to the Romans, according to Tacitus, amongst others, Saturn being driven from his throne was both a metaphysical and a historical event, complete with Saturn's servants being driven out from their native lands and forced to flee by Jupiter's indomitable aggression. 
The apparent contradiction of the Romans celebrating a god who was said to have tried to devour their highest god and protector, who was also the grandfather of the demigod who founded Rome in the first place, implies that there is a more metaphysical meaning behind both these myths and celebrations, which is something we will explore deeper when we cover the metaphysics apparent in wider European creation myths at a later date. Deus Natalis Sol Invictus is, as the name implies, a festival to celebrate the rebirth of the sun, unconquered by the long winter nights. There is actually very little known about how the festival was celebrated, but it was obviously important enough for the Christians to set the birthday of their saviour as being the same day as the birthday of Sol Invictus. Nesta, I believe you had something to add regarding the solstice and the celebration of the sun in general. I must say, Tyrus, that was a beautiful collection of myths and traditions about the Hyperboreans and the solstice you put together. Now, regarding the solstice, as we said in our previous episode, only in the Arctic regions can one behold the solar circles in their full scale and magnificent. And our ancestors in our Urheimat in the utmost north were inspired to partake in the sun's eternal struggle against the lasting polar darkness on the side of our gods and heroes who were thought to actually carry out this struggle on the celestial and the metaphysical levels. And the struggle culminates at the solstices. Now the solstice as a celestial phenomenon itself and uh, as our ancestors understood it has multiple significance on many levels simultaneously. On the metaphysical level it symbolizes a perennial struggle of the solar cosmic forces of order, balance and renewal that we Aryans as a race are a worldly corporeal manifestation of against the forces of disorder, confusion, dissolution and decay. Forces that act indefatigably, continuously on both the physical and the metaphysical plane and drive the world and the individual into disarray and collapse, if not counteracted. These are exactly the forces that are so accurately portrayed in our mythology and traditions as serpents, monsters, trolls, bandits, witches, Amazons, titans and chthonic gods. There is an old Vedic axiom that goes, as is the individual, so is the universe. And according to the Hermetic tradition, as above, so below. Heraclitus, the unsurpassable mystic and philosopher from the 6th century BC, said, the road up and the road down is one and the same. What applies in the macrocosm, on a grand universal scale, it applies also in the microcosm, in the human level of existence and experience, and further to the microscopic and all the way down to the subatomic level. This principle and arrangement is beautifully portrayed in the form of the most commonly found symbol among the Aryans throughout their history in thousands of years, the swastika, a harmonious, orderly rotation around a steady, unchanging center, a picture we find from the grand scale of the galaxies down to the structure of the atom and the rotation of the subatomic particles. The conditions in the macrocosm and microcosm differ only in volume and quantity, not in quality. And similarly, the conditions in the higher spiritual plane have their counterparts in the physical, material level. Our ancestors, the higher castes of them at least, the mystics and the philosophers, were aware of that analogy and connection between the metaphysical the universal, the grand scale, and the human condition. And when, in the golden ages of the Aryan past, they were leading the societies, they established a worldview, a tradition that was celestial, inspired, attuned, and harmonized to the order of the world. And they believed that the whole universe, nature, humans, and the gods themselves were all subjected and regulated by this inherent, unchanging and harmonious order of the world, as Plato describes it, a fact clearly expressed in all area mythologies. 
our ancestors' religious beliefs have always been orientated towards the heavens, and likewise their religious practices were an acknowledgement, a recollection and the celebration of this very cosmic harmony, order and equilibrium of forces, manifested in astrophysical phenomena as well. Now the choice of the solstice as the pinnacle and culmination for these celebrations, and not some other astronomic events, has to do both with the practical importance of the cycle of the Sun in the Arctic regions where we claim our origins, but it also has to do with our ancestors' inner experience and understanding of the struggle of the psyche and the personality against passions, illusions and destructive tendencies that can only be mastered and tamed by primarily recognizing them within ourselves. And the recognition is possible by the help of this divine, solar, absolute essence that lies within us as well and of whom the sun is also the material embodiment of. Fantastically put, Nesta. Freya, I believe you also have something for us to do with the significance of the sun and solar worship in the Nordic tradition. Yes, I will, Tyrus. Our ancestors have been sun worshippers, we know that, all the way back to Nordic Bronze Age and before that. But I like to start out by mentioning a beautiful artifact from Denmark that was found in the beginning of the century in September 1909, and that is Solvagnen, it's called. It's a sun chariot from Nordic Bronze Age, around 1400 BC, and it's a sun disk that is laminated with gold and have this typically Nordic spiral ornament on the disc and it's being carried on a chariot on wheels driven by a horse and it was found by a farmer in Trundholm in the northwestern sea land in Denmark when he plowed the fields and this sun chariot Solvagnen illustrates the idea that the sun was drawn on an eternal journey by a divine horse and it really truly shows that we were sun worshippers up here in the north. Mm. The object is about 54 centimeters by 35 centimeters and actually 96 years later after the initial discovery when they used metal detectors they found additional 21 parts to the sun chariot they found the wheels, etc. So Solvangen is perhaps the finest example of Scandinavian Bronze Age religion. And it also provides us insight into the timing of the domestication of the horse in Scandinavia. And this artifact from Nordic Bronze Age is now on display on the National Museum in Denmark and it's a national proud symbol. And in 2010, they printed Solvangen on their thousand crown banknote. So back there at Nordic Bronze Age, before we found our own metal, we were importing in return for fine amber that we have here along the sand coast of Scandinavia. And we became expert metal workers Anyway, I'd like to speak on another important symbol in the north that we have, and it's the Sun Cross. It's also called the Wheel of the Year, eller Årshjulet. It's a cross with a circle around it, and it represents the four cosmic turning points, winter solstice and spring equinox, and summer solstice and fall equinox, these four points turning points. And the Wheel of the Year, or Shivlet, um comes to an end at the winter solstice on December 22nd. This is the start of our Yule celebration. It's the darkest time of the entire year, and the myth says that the axle of the Earth stands still for three days. 
and we are being invited to go deep down into the underworld and drink the mead of wisdom and the lady of the mead shall meet us there and will be served by Valkyries. So going down into the underworld is of course a metaphor of meeting ourselves, taking the time before we start a Yule celebration to go into the dark corners of our being and maybe find valuable wisdom about ourselves personally and us collectively and about our forefathers and our gods. This is a very special time and we in the north we are so familiar and used to the dark and we sort of like the dark. I'm not saying everybody likes the dark but it's a time for reflection and uh, growing in our personality and understanding. Anyway, we also do celebrate solstice with the blutes. It's very important blute at the winter solstice. And then we take the sun cross and we put it on fire. And that gives us a little warmth in the cold. In early summer, in June, we celebrate the summer solstice. And then we decorate the sun cross with birch leaves. Björklöv, and we also make flower rings that we put on our heads. Uh, the summer solstice is also known as midsummer, and it occurs when uh, the earth pole is the maximum tilted towards the sun, and the day is longer than the night. And in the northern hemisphere, we have continuous daylight around the summer solstice is called midsummer sun which means the sun never goes down and if you are way up there in the mountains where there could be snow you could also go skiing both day and night is a very special event so midsummer is a fertility and harvest feast and we dance around the pole and that is an old proto-indo-european custom to dance in a circle and we also dance around the Yule tree. Midsummer is a magical custom and everybody celebrates it and we say that the virgins go out in silence and meditation and pick nine different kind of flowers dreaming of their future husband and lover and then they put the flowers under the pillow and continue dream, dreaming and asking the gods for the arrival of their perfect match. Celebrating Midsummer is also a folkish festival and we dress up in our big detractor. There are handmade outfits with special patterns and colors for each county that we come from in Scandinavia. And we play folk music and dance all night and it's simply too exciting and too light uh, to sleep. It's the lightest night of the entire year. So midsummer is mainly celebrated in Sweden. In Denmark, in Norway and other Scandinavian countries, they have midsummer fires instead. And we, for some reason, we have kept this ancient celebration of the sun here in Sweden. At midsummer, we're also honoring the god of the harvest, the fertility god Frey. He's also called Lord, and Frey is a veneer god. And the veneers are the oldest Gudaet, or the pantheon of the gods in Norse myth. He is the son of Njord who is the god of the waves and the oceans. And Frey is also the brother to uh, Freya, who is the clairvoyant lady of the mead, the high priestess of Said and the leader of the Valkyries and the chooser of the slain. Well, she have many names, obviously. The fertility gods were very important for our forefathers at midsummer time and they gave uh, offerings to them 
and there were Frey and Freya symbols found in the land of Sweden. In many places, there were wooden carved symbols depicting the masculine power of Frey. And, but when Christianity was established in our land around 1100, the church removed these wooden symbols. They found them inappropriate and provoking. I'd like to mention two runes that represent the fertility god Frey, who is also called Yngvi, and that is the rune Ingvas or Ing, and it stands for male sexuality and procreation and harvest. The other rune is Yara, who is also mentioned as Frey's rune, and it stands for good annual growth, the year of the harvest. And it also represents the time shift from the time of Baldr, the light and the shining one, over to the time of Hörder, the blind and the dark time. And Baldr and Hörder are the two brothers representing the light and the dark sides of the sun cross, the wheel of the year. So now let me just mention something about Norse cosmology and Norse myth the sun and the moon, etc. I have mentioned some of this in earlier episodes. The sun goddess in Norse myth is called Sol or Sunna and she has two horses that pulls her sun chariot and her sun chariot is called Alfredul. That means she lights up the worlds. It could also mean Röd Ull, red wool. And her equipage, Alfredul, is said to be an elf beam, or Alf Stråle. And an elf is said to be a human-like supernatural being that shines with magical powers. And this idea with the elf-like being comes from old Proto-Indo-European roots and could be from Nordic Bronze Age. The word elf is found throughout the Germanic languages and have originally meant white being. The soul goddess is being pursued by the wolf skull, which means mockery. And the wolf will devour the sun goddess at the end of the cosmic cycle when the worlds, the gods and mankind are destroyed in an apocalyptic event called Ragnarök. The worlds are destroyed by fire and water and the nine worlds sinks into the abyss of Ginnungagap. But the earth will then ascend again with ready to harvest trees and fields and the cosmic wheel will go on. There are other names for Sol. She could be called Daystar and Disk, Everglow all bright scene or fair wheel, grace shine and elf disc. Sol is the daughter to Mundilfare and Nat. And Mundilfare means the one moving according to particular times. It's her father in the sky. And Sol have a brother who's called Mani and they are both beautiful and fair. Sol is married to Glenn and Glenn means opening in the clouds and they have a daughter that will take over after Ragnarök. She will survive Ragnarök. But Mani, he will not survive Ragnarök. He will be swallowed by the moon hound with a moon dog called Managram who is believed to be the son of the wolf Fenrir. I have a little poem about the father of uh, Sol, Mundilfari, and it goes like this. Mundilfari is he who began the moon and fathered the flaming sun. The round of heaven each day they run to tell the time for men. So the myth also says that it was the sparks from Muspelheim, the land of fire, that created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And Muspelheim 
is, like I said, the land of fire that melts the icy land of Niflheim. And then from the drops from the ice, the giant Ymir is made. And from that, the worlds, the nine worlds are being made. I have one more little poem here about the sun. It goes like this. The sun, the sister of the moon from the south, her right hand cast over the heaven's rim. No knowledge she had where her home should be. The moon knew not what might was his. The stars knew not where their stations were. Well, it sounds like they don't know where their home station is. But the myth actually says that the goddess Sol, her disc was driven on the chariot by the horses during the day. But at the sunset, it was descending in the west. And then the disc, the sun disc, was put on a ship on the ocean until the dawn again. And then again put on the chariots and shining over the world. So we have never let go of our heathen traditions and all the way back to the Nordic Bronze Age we've been honoring and worshipping the life-giving sun. And one could say that there is a renaissance happening in the land where people are hungry to know more about our ancient old cultures. They're interested in being part of blues and celebrating the various times in cosmos relating to the sun and to the gods. They're sort of looking for their identity, which is lost in many ways. For in such a time as this, when our trust for governmental rule and leaders are virtually erased, we are, through our blood memory, being reminded of our ancestors' respect, dependency and awe of our land, our gods and goddesses and cosmos. We shall worship our life-giving sun and we shall give credence to the pantheon of our gods and we shall be taught the old ways. And again shall we awaken to the Indo-European soul and have a new vision to guard our own traditions, culture, and our blood. That was it for me, and I want to thank you so much for listening. Another thing that I wanted to discuss is something that Nesta brought up in the previous part of this episode, but we had unfortunately run out of time to talk about. You mentioned the Great Flood, which is something that appears again and again throughout mythology, from Indo-European to Mesopotamian to Semitic, seemingly reflecting a very real event still in the presence of memory for many people across the world, or at least those whose race or culture had originated in or around the Northern Hemisphere. However, there is something very unique about the Greek interpretation of this flood that we should mention, and that pertains to the creation of something that the Greeks dubbed the Earthborn Races or the Chthonic Races, and how the interpretation of them differs to that of the Greek idea of the Aryan race. The Earthborn races, mentioned as being crushed by Teusa, founder of Troy, was being spoken of by Aristotle as being slow, primitive, and of low intelligence, were said to have been created shortly after the Great Flood. As the myth goes, uh, Zeus takes the form of a mortal man and visits the homes of the people of pre-Hellenic Greece, and is set upon by a man from amongst their people, who try to butcher him and feast upon human flesh and drink human blood, unknowingly trying to attack the god of gods, the Aryan Skyfather. The esoteric reasoning for this could be that the pre-Aryan people of Greece sought to devour and destroy Zeus, the forefather of the Aryan people. Another could be that these people served Saturn, known as Kronos by the Greeks, and was worshipped as both Saturn and Kronos before the arrival of the Jupiter and Zeus-worshipping Indo-Europeans in Greece and Latium. In their worship of Saturn, 
They were attempting to devour Zeus in the same way that Saturn had tried before them. The esotericism of which we will explore in a later episode. Either way, the result is the same. Zeus is disgusted at these people and in his righteous fury vows to cleanse the earth. These humans who were those who Zeus sought to prevent from attaining the divine fire in Prometheus Bound, which we will discuss in part next episode, were worthy of naught but revulsion. The idea of Zeus as a cruel overlord oppressing mankind makes far more sense when one learns of the state of the pre-Indo-European Greeks engaging in cannibalism and the human sacrifices of innocence. What is even more interesting is that in trying to kill and devour Zeus in this way violates the trust between host and guest, which was integral to Indo-Europeans. Again, I can only apologise for touching on so many integral topics, but the sanctity of this host-guest relationship was sacred to the Aryans, of whom Zeus was the father. For these people to not only engage in the lowest form of depravity, but to also violate this most sacred of Indo-European oaths would be enough for anyone to swear vengeance upon them and their kin. And so Zeus begins his cleansing. Only two humans would be spared directly, uh, being demigods themselves, although a more scholarly appropriate term would be demi-titans. These were Deucalion and Pyrrha, one the son of Prometheus, forethought, and the other the daughter of Epimetheus, afterthought. These two were seen by Zeus as the perfect couple, the virtuous husband and wife, and were spared from his wrath in this great flood. Their union in marriage is obviously symbolic of wisdom itself, and Prometheus and Epimetheus in a way resemble the combination of Hugin and Munin, whose names mean thought and memory, or in other words, thought and afterthought. Of course, to equate them with the ravens of Odin might be reading too deeply, but which bird is always sent out to find land in these flood myths? From Gilgamesh to Noah, we find them first release a dove, then release a raven. Considering these two also connect with my earlier point about Herodotus's misunderstanding regarding Dodona, the link is clear. The dove and raven are let loose and settled where it was deemed appropriate by the gods. Anyway, this couple are spared and go to the Oracle of Delphi, who had likewise been spared. Notice there's a trend here. They ask the oracle how they are to go about rebuilding mankind, and the oracle tells them, and apologies for my lack of poetic and metaphorical exploration here, to throw stones over their shoulders, which then become human beings. Human beings with no connection to the gods, no divine blood, like that of Deucalion and Pyrrha. These people, who were known as the Earthborn Races, and were known to Teusir, founder of the city of Troy, and even Aristotle, as being primitive, violent, and of notably low intelligence, as he says in his book, The Politics. They fundamentally lacked that divine spark possessed by this couple, spared by Zeus. In terms of esoteric alchemy, for lack of a better term, the element of earth represents the physical body, whereas fire represents the will. This story of an earthborn people, contrasted with those who knew of the divine fire given to them by Prometheus, also links in very well with Prometheus Bound, which we'll be discussing in part during the next episode. So, did these survivors of the flood go on to have children and pass on their divine blood? Well, of course, they went on to have many children, who went on to found many tribes across Europe. The most famous and relevant to the Greeks was a man known as Helen, founder of the Aryan tribe known as the Hellenes, from which we take the name Hellenic. Now, couple this idea of a flood and the origin of the Hellenic race, along with my own aforementioned theory regarding the black dove being a merging of a dove and a raven, the two birds associated with the flood myths, and Dodona being purported as the origin of the Hellenic race, and suddenly things really begin to line up. This is the Greek explanation for the nobility of the Aryan race, the only people to be descended directly from the gods themselves, 
and this also allowed them to exalt their own founder, Helen. After all, it is only natural for any group of Europeans to celebrate the nobility of their brothers, but to always put themselves at the top of the list. Tyrus, I enjoyed very much your interpretation of the Hellenic myths, but I admit I was uh, moved even more by the beautiful poems, the odes of Pindar, you quoted in your monologue, where he speaks of Hyperborea. To begin, to begin with, I would like to say that Pindar was composing popular poetry, poetry for the people, which was read out loud, understood and appreciated by the common man and citizen of classical antiquity, during religious festivals, the Olympic Games and so on. And the fact that this beautiful, elaborate, aesthetic poetry was popular culture at the time indicates and underlines once more the superior level of spiritual cultivation and artistic sensitivity our ancestors had, especially compared to the level of today. Think, what is popular culture nowadays? And we don't have to go all the way back to classical antiquity to compare. In 18th century Austria, for example, popular culture was listening to the latest works of Mozart. That is just a thought to remind everybody how much work and effort we have in front of us on the cultural front in order to help raise our people from this destructive, downward spiral of cultural and general decadence that has been afflicted upon us. And this effort is an integral and extremely important part of our political struggle and an integral part of this podcast as well. Now that was a minor parenthesis. Back to Pindar. What is he saying about the Hyperboreans? Neither ship nor marching feet may find the wanderer's way to the gatherings of the Hyperboreans. Neither disease nor old age is mixed in the sacred blood. Far from labor and strife they live. Pindar is talking about a tradition well known to his audience, a memory of a higher civilization at a distant golden age, living in divine conditions, almost at a non-material plane. A civilization to which his audience feels a connection with. The memory of Hyperborea in the Greco-Roman antiquity is that of a superior, golden age of the Aryans, and compared to that, our ancestors' historical time was a degradation and a time of decline. Now, this idea has many aspects, but I would like today to focus on one of them, our ancestors' cyclical perception of time and history, which is relevant to our episode, to the golden age of the Hyperboreans, the floods that Tyre spoke of, and the solstices. Our ancestors believed that the world was a timeless order, which regulated, as we said, the existence of both humans and gods, a repeated succession of world creations and world endings, without an absolute beginning and without a definite and final end. Heraclitus said about the nature of the world, This universe, which is the same for all, has not been made by any god or man, but it always has been, is and will be an ever-living fire, kindling itself by regular measures and going out by regular measures. Aristotle writes, The world is without becoming, not transitory but eternal, without alteration, without growth or diminution. And Plato completes the idea. The same sum of being is preserved. Nothing is created and nothing is lost. The Vedic literature describes the nature and the essence of the world in a similar manner, however more elaborately, and the idea of the eternal timeless order is more consistent, more dominant and fundamental in the Indo-Aryan traditions. According to our ancestors, the world moves in cycles of degradation and renewal, divided in ages that compose the time frame for the existence of the material and immaterial world, for both humans and gods. I'm sure most of our listeners have heard of the golden, silver, heroic and bronze ages, as described by Hesiod, Virgil and Ovid, 
or the yugas by the Vedic traditions, very fundamental in our forefathers' worldview. Plato, again, in his work Politikos, the Statesman, gives a description of how these ages evolve. When the Creator, at the end of a cycle, leaves the world and the inferior gods desert mankind, the world remembers God's teachings and keeps an order, which gradually degenerates. And further on, in his work Timaeus, Plato gives another statement, coming from a very old Egyptian source. There have been and will be again many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story which even you have preserved that once upon a time Phaethon, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds in his father's chariot because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, burnt up all that was upon the earth and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now this has the form of a myth, Plato continues, but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. This is a cleansing of the earthly world, a transition between ages, by fire and flood, and we add, of course, the deluge of ice that afflicted our Hyperborean ancestors, the Proto-Aryans in the Arctic North, and pushed them violently out of their golden age into a perilous time of long wanderings and migrations, leaving them only with a small fraction of their knowledge, a small fraction of their understanding and achievements, a memory weakened by every passing generation. But it was enough to grant the wandering Aryans an overall superiority as they conquered and dominated all peoples they came across. The transition between ages signifies changes on all levels of human existence, but of that aspect we will talk about in details in a coming episode. The Aryan view of time and cosmogony is direct opposite to the Semitic one, where Judaism as well as Islam and Christianity belong. The linear and progressive worldview claiming that the universe is not timeless. The world was once created and the world will finally and permanently end at the second coming and judgment day, an eschatological final consummation. Now this is not small details. This contrast is fundamental and it mirrors the yawning, unbridgeable gap and antithesis between the traditional Aryan and Semitic worldviews and characters that have led the peoples bearing them in a cultural, religious, political and physical conflict since the time they met each other in the dawn of history. A conflict still current and even more critical today. And the outcome of this conflict will decide the future of the cultures and the future of the people. The Semitic worldview, as expressed in the linear and progressive perception of time and history, is said to offer mankind, for the first time, some kind of direction towards a specific goal and destiny in a faraway future by a faraway God, a goal that the whole humanity should strive for in order to get a reward in the afterlife, they claim. Unfortunately, the same progressive understanding of time, history and evolution was adopted by modern science as well, secularized of course, where the element of the divine and the metaphysical are secondary and unimportant. So, while the modern European, the modern white man, becomes more and more analytical, more rational, more materialistic and more of an atheist, the Semitic notion of linear and progressive time, evolution and destiny is not losing ground. On the contrary, it's gaining momentum camouflaged with a cloth of science. Science that bears all the characteristics of a religion, of a dogma, with its own creational myths, with its own miracles, its own re revelation, its own promise of eternal bliss for the individual. 
and much like its Semitic religious counterpart, it is intolerant, unforgiving, and revengeful to dissidents. And the Aryans lose their traditional community, nearness, and familiarity to the divine, to the gods, and as they are cut off from the perennial reality and condition, they get cut off from the true selves. Now, if we return to the cycles and the solstice, we can understand now the importance of the solstice and the solar cycles had for our ancestors better, as these minor solar cycles were seen as an integral and more familiar and understandable part of the great cosmic creational cycles, a part that they could physically observe and relate to. But our forefathers were not only observers of these cycles, but active participants in this eternal cosmic drama, as they felt it was their responsibility as well to fight along their gods, in a mutual, respectful communion, as Plato says, in order to defend, sustain, and renew the creation. And their struggle along the side of their gods was against the spiritual and psychological counterparts of these same cosmic forces, those parts understood by the human mind that erode, poison, and undermine the order of the world and also our societies and the personality. And as you, Tyrus, also mentioned in your monologue, the story of the proud mythological hero, the Aryan warrior with divine blood, discovering first his ancestral weapons and setting on a long, perilous journey. He masters himself, accomplishes various tasks, slays the serpent, tames the bull, thus attains divine knowledge and brings order to his society where he becomes the king and later on transcends to the gods. This is a description of an Aryan archetype, and it is up to us to realize it. It is up to us to actually become the archetypes of our race, to become the living, breathing, and acting personification and embodiment of the soul of our race, whose true essence is otherwise concealed and unfathomable, but it is revealed to us when manifested in these archetypes, archetypes which we have both a potential and a duty to embody. And as we do that, as we strive to become the archetypes of our race, we participate in the cosmic and the metaphysical struggle of the world as well. And we raise ourselves from the mundane, we raise ourselves from the temporal, we raise ourselves from the meaningless and become who we really are. Awaken, noble and fearless Aryan men and women, we become the heroes of our race. And that's it for this episode. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this as much as we enjoy putting together a collection of some of the finest work of the ancient world. Join us next time for an exploration of Indo-European myths and lifestyles, as well as a few in-depth looks into topics touched on throughout this episode. Until then, you can find us on YouTube as Aristogenesis and Instagram as aristogenesis.ig. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Aristogenesis is presented to you by Nordisk Radio.se